Run. Well, welcome to On The Run, and it's a very special On The Run from Sydney yet again. Yes, I was in Sydney. Well, I was in Melbourne, then I went to Sydney, then I went back to Melbourne again, now I'm back in Sydney again. Come up to uh, the Regulating the Game conference uh, that's been running all this week in, in Sydney. And it's a very special on the run because I'm recording this at night. So it's a little bit of an intimate on the run. Uh, normally I record these on Thursday afternoon or Thursday daytime to be edited Thursday to run Friday morning. But I didn't get a chance, very busy day today. So now it's late at night on Thursday and it will be edited, I am told, through the night and published Friday morning. So uh, on the run from Sydney, uh, thoughts on Crown Sydney. Now, I did promise you last week that I would give you some feedback on Crown Sydney. Uh, I stayed there last week. Uh, lovely property. Uh, the the hardware is immaculate, uh, a needle, very straight up and down, small footprint, but very high building, the tallest building in Sydney. The views are amazing. I think some of the service standards still need to, to, to get there to new property, but that's not unusual uh, that that happens when new properties open. Uh, it's had a little bit of trouble um with opening and with getting the gaming opening of course with what's been going on in australia everybody knows that so um we wish them well wish them good luck in 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 ramping up the property and getting it tight um needs a little bit of work but the the property itself what they've got to work with is fantastic absolutely great property the rooms were very very nice and the facilities are nice so just a little bit of um, operational stuff to, to get tightened up, as with all new property openings. So let's see if that happens over the next 12 months or so. And wish we wish them well at uh, Crown Sydney. They've got a fantastic property to work with. Um, thoughts on Macau GGR before we jump into the week's stories. Uh, obviously, the big question since Macau's open on January the 8th is what will the new normal be? What will the new normal GGR be? And in my infamous Macau has fallen cover story that I wrote in August last year that received an enormous number of hits, uh, I said that when COVID zero is completely gone, I estimate that there will be about 8 billion mop per month because of the other problem, which is China's posture towards Macau. And what I meant by that, of course, was uh, restrictions on capital flows, uh, not really helping the industry, not seeing the industry as a good thing. And what we've seen since January 8 is a bit of a change, a little bit of money in town. There seems to be some liquidity around, some question marks around where that liquidity has come from. Is it a stock or a flow? Um, is it sustainable? And we've seen the governments of Macau be somewhat of Macau and I guess even China be somewhat helpful to the industry, which surprised me. So it seems things not only have we got rid of COVID zero, but a little bit of the other problem has been wound back, has been ameliorated. So we're not at 8 billion. We seem to be more like at maybe 11 billion per month. So that's good. That's we, we January came in at 11.5. Um, February came in, I think it was at 9.5, a shorter month without Chinese New Year, uh, but a full month. January wasn't even a full month because the reopening was January 8. So if we say 10, 11 billion a month, um, maybe even 12, well, 12 would be sort of around 1.5, wouldn't it? So we're, right, instead of looking at a billion US a month, we're looking at maybe a billion to a billion point five per month. So instead of it being eight, we're looking at maybe um, instead of being eight, sorry, instead of it being twelve billion US per year, we're looking at it maybe being up to eighteen, could even be twenty. Who knows? So 
let's see. But this this number, this sort of level of play has continued on. Started at Chinese New Year, but just stayed. And I did say that I wouldn't make a judgment call until late March. Well, it's not late March yet, but it is the end of the first week of March and the play has continued. So I'm starting to think that that might be the level. The level might be 18 billion uh, US per year. Let's see. Anyway, that's enough on Macau GGR. Let's get into the news of the week and the news of, uh, we'll start with Macau. So when Macau uh, confirmed that its uh, Q1 23 revenues are tracking up 75% year on year, and you might ask, where did they confirm this? They confirmed this in an announcement they made to the uh, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange um, announcing 600 million US dollars in convertible bonds being issued. And they took that opportunity to talk about this uptick, uh, very big uptick, of course, in revenue. So that's good. MGM China, uh, Morgan Stanley came out and said, that they believed MGM China would gain market share by 2024 based upon the additional tables it got. So in the table reallocation, which IAG covered very heavily over the Christmas period, 6,000 tables now allocated in Macau and uh, MGM got 750 of them, up from 553 at the end of 2019. So the basically the pre-COVID number, let's say. So that's a big increase. You know, for roughly 550 to 750. So 200 on 550, what's that? 30%? So no, more, more. Uh, well, 200 on 633%, 32%, something like that. Of course, tables doesn't necessarily equal revenue, but it's a great start. All right, moving on. Um, SJM Holdings uh, announced that their financial year 22, the full year loss, was wait for it 994 million US dollars. So, what's six million between friends? Let's call it a bill. So, a billion US wow, that's a lot of money to lose for the year. But of course, 2023 is going to be a very different year to 2022. And SJM did come out and say that they were hoping that Grand Lisboa Palace could reach EBIT to break even in the second half of this year. Well, what can I say? Really? Only the second half of this year and only EBITDA break even, not net profit break even. I think all the analysts have come out and said that, you know, all the other operators were already operating at a profit right now. So, you know, of course, that's Palace itself, not the whole company. But, you know, Grand, it just goes to show what a problem Grand Lisboa Palace has been for SJM and continues to be. Um, I think I read somewhere about it, only having 1% market share. So Grand Lisboa Palace is a real uh, a real problem for SJM. Uh, the Hong Kong chief executive, John Lee, came over to Macau to visit his counterpart in Macau, Ho Yat Sen, and they toured Macau, a uh, Galaxy Macau's new GICC, the Galaxy International Convention Center. So that's a real tick next to Galaxy's name, isn't it? The fact that they chose a Galaxy property to tour, um, it really really says something about the government's support for Galaxy. So I thought that was interesting. What else? Oh, Li Wu Chan uh, spoke quite passionately in court. Uh, yesterday, which is March the 8th, because it's late on March the 9th for me now. It'll be March the 10th for you when you see this. Yes, he spoke quite passionately in court about um, his 90-year-old father crying and his two kids asking where their dad is, said we're not a triad group. Um, but given what's happened to Mr. Chow at Sun City, it's probably not looking too good for Mr. Chan. Mr. Chow got 18 years, so will Mr. Chow get 15 years? Hopefully, in his mind, he'll be found not guilty. Well, let's wait and see. But we've got to wait until April 21. That's when the the um, sentencing will be. Um, only eight of Macau's 36 licensed junkets are operational, according to the president of the Macau Professional Association of Gaming Promoters, um, Yu Yo Hung. 
we had a story by him or oh, oh, that, that, that interviewing him one of our journalists interviewed him and um well it was pierce pierce chan interviewed him and we wrote an article that we published in the march issue and he said that only even though the dicj had licensed 36 junkets only eight are actually doing business so it shows how much the junket industry the vip industry has just been decimated and he said only three of the six concessionaires are involved in the junket business and he blames the lack of rev share the fact that there's no under the new junket law or under the new macau gaming law actually there's no uh ability for junkets to rev share anymore and his quote was or the quote we quoted him saying that the industry was not developing healthily and is almost extinct is what he said so if you wanted any more bad news for the junket industry there it is from the horse's mouth and he runs his own junket uh, our uh, sister publication, Macau CSR, which covers economic diversification and uh, social responsibility, non-gaming uh, uh, topics in Macau, um, signs a strategic partnership agreement with Orbis Macau, the charity, the I, um, the the site charity Orbis, which is quite strong in Macau. So we signed that agreement, and there'll be more of them to come. More agreements with associations and charities and NGOs in Macau, which um, that's uh, good work by Macau CSR. And congratulations to the director, Rita Pun, for doing that. Uh, Philippines, let's move over to the Philippines now. So the Philippines GGR, um, Padcor came out and said that it was up 14% sequentially uh, to $934 million US dollars in uh, Q4 of last year. So they've been out of COVID for a while over in the Philippines. So that's a post-COVID number, but it's still a, po a COVID recovery number. It's still recovering from COVID. They're almost there. They're almost back to pre-COVID levels, but not quite. So, you know, that's nearly a billion. So a billion and a quarter, well, that's 4 billion in a year. So that's nearly up to that sort of magical 5 billion number for the Philippines. So Philippines, Australia, Singapore, all sort of around that US $5 billion a year GGR. Uh, Bloomberry, of course, the owners and operators of Solaire and um, arguably the leaders of the industry over there in the Philippines, they booked a US $20 million profit in Q4, just for the last quarter. Um, and they said their mass is uh, fully recovered. So that's great. Of course, the VIP is a little bit compromised because of China. Um, you know, China not opening until the 8th of January. So obviously no, no Chinese VIP in Q4 for them. Let's head over to Australia now. And uh, I'm obviously in Australia at the moment and I have been at this Regulating the Game conference and I've been meeting with lots of Australian uh, operators and suppliers and other industry participants. So we've really been doing a lot of uh, networking here in Australia. Uh, we had a story on Monday that the Victorian regulator uh, talked about her plan B uh, to continue the casino if Crown loses their license at the end of the two year uh, monitor period. Although she did say that the remediation efforts of Blackstone and of Crown have been pleasing. So that's really good. That's that's a sign that Crown would get its license back. But she's saying that if it doesn't get its license back, we have a plan B. Uh, Bruce, Math Bruce Matheson, a lot of people, a lot of non-Australians won't know that name, but Bruce Matheson's one of Australia's richest men. He's a pokies king. So sort of slot machines, but slot machines outside of casinos, lots of um, pubs and clubs and uh, slot machine venues in Australia, particularly in New South Wales and Victoria. Um, he came out and decided to buy a lot of star entertainment shares. So he now owns just under 10%. Those shares were $5.43 Australian in March, 2018. In mid-February, they were down to $1.28. So that is really cheap. Of course, this is on the back of all of the, the issues and the regulatory problems in Australia. But he's taken the view that it's a strategic 
play and the share price is very cheap at the moment and he now owns 10 percent of star so uh he's the biggest shareholder now and he's hoping that things will turn around as i'm sure star is and i'm sure all the industry participants are a uh, sports bet claims that they now have 48 percent of the australian sports betting market that's a big market and, um, you know, years gone by, who would ever have thought that a UK based company like Flutter Entertainment, that one of their brands, one of their subsidiary sports bet could own half of all of the market. So that's pretty amazing. That's their number. They're claiming that number. But, you know, it must be based on something. The Tab Corp CEO, uh, Adam Ritkenskild, uh, came out and called for a national uh regulatory framework for australian sports betting he did that at the regulating the game conference uh, both ben blaschke and myself were there when he did it uh quite interesting how would that work who knows how would that work with the fact that uh each state is its own jurisdiction with its own regulations its own tax rates who knows but he's calling for that he also called for a reduction in advertising of sports betting as well um South Korea, the foreigner only casinos over there, so mainly GKL and Paradise, uh, the Seven Luck brand and the, the Walker Hill brand. Um, they continue to surge throughout February. They're making a big comeback. I mean, for, for low base, of course, but they're making big strides to come back. And so Korea is going to be an interesting market. And of course, we're getting close to Inspire um, uh, opening. And of course, we also have uh, the Paradise IR at Intron as well. So I'm hoping to uh, be in Korea. I will definitely visit Korea this year. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, finally, an interesting little story. Uh, Genting Hong Kong, which of course went bankrupt, 2.8 billion US in, in debt. Um, they had to sell their ships and of their four ships the Explorer Dream, the Genting Dream, the World Dream, and the Global Dream. Um, they've managed to retain two of them. Then their, their Phoenix company that reincarnated from the ashes out of Singapore, Resorts World Cruises, has purchased Explorer Dream and Genting Dream. But Global Dream was purchased by Disney. And so I guess that'll go over to the US. And we learned this week that World Dream... Um, has been purchased by Saudi, Saudi Arabian company, a new cruise company out of there. So they got to keep two and they lost two. So I guess one of the two that they kept, one is sailing out of Singapore and the other, I guess, will sail out of Hong Kong. I think we learned that last week as well. So really interesting week in, in Asian gaming and in the, in the industry for the APAC region. Uh, I'm having uh, a little bit of a fun day tomorrow and enjoying myself for once and then i'll be back to melbourne on saturday tomorrow being friday so that'll be today for you uh then i'll be back to melbourne on saturday and a little bit more in australia uh before singapore uh malaysia cambodia and then over to the philippines so look for me in the philippines from early april and uh i will be in singapore and malaysia and Cambodia for in March. And so uh, looking forward to that. And we have some interesting announcements coming soon, but I can't tell you about them just yet. So that's it for On The Run this week. We will see you next week and bye for now. See ya. Run.